High in the remote, desolate borderlands of Nepal and Tibet, there is this ancient kingdom far beyond the reaches of the modern world. It feels like it has this great, expansive spiritualness to it. This is Mustang. Here's the Tibetan Plateau. What would we do without NASA? I mean, they produce some of the most absolutely stunning images on the planet. And what I want to bring you to your attention is that this is Mustang right here. And if you look at it carefully, you can see that it's a very natural corridor from the South Indian plain through the foothills of the uh, Himalayas up onto the plateau. And it's quite well known, as Pete pointed out to you earlier, as a major corridor of trade, primarily of salt, but other objects as well. Salt coming down from the plateau, goods from the southern Indian plain going up onto the plateau. And it's been known as a major trade corridor for at least, oh, 1,400 years or so. But it's quite clear that there's an antiquity here that goes well beyond that. That is, other projects, other ideas that have been proposed to suggest that that this region is not simply a relatively recent addition to prehistory, but in fact has some very substantial antiquity that goes way back perhaps as many as, oh, I don't know, 20 to 25,000 years. Uh, fortunately, we have some data that might suggest that's the case. That's a different project, and I'll get into that at some other point in the future. Right now, just be clear where we're at in the world and get a sense of what this plateau actually looks like. One of the most important features, though, of our project, and this is something that I really think that Pete needs some, some, really, some great applause for as well, is that among his, his romantic interest, if you will, in the, the mystery of this place, is also the sense that he brought to the project early on that this is a fragile cultural heritage that really demands a significant degree of preservation. The Nepali state is very poor. They have very limited control over the activities that take place in the hinterlands. And so there's a significant amount of damage and destruction and looting of these archaeological sites. And even though there are thousands of caves out there in, the, in this region, many of them have suffered the depredations of people coming through and, and literally going through things like this, getting to them before we, the archaeologists and the explorers, get there. What you're looking here is a, is a scientist in the middle, Charles Ramble, from uh, now at the Sorbonne, that is actually studying the manuscripts that we recovered in 2008 from one of the cave complexes called Marzong. So this was actually uh, a rescue project that brought these things back out that is part of our project as well. And you can see the effects of the looting that have taken place here. What you're looking at is a, what's called a kabam. It's a chorten or a reliquary that had once the remains of an important personage, probably a lama, perhaps a very important monk, uh, buried inside after cremation, often buried then with objects that were important to that individual. And you can see that these things have been looted substantially in the past. One of our team members, Sukrasagar of Nepal, is looking somewhat bemused about what do I do with this? But part of our project has been an outreach effort to try to get involvement with the local community to say, look, this is part of your heritage. You need to be thinking about preserving these objects and these sites insofar as you're able to do so. Our hope is to provide them with some of the resources, museums that we can build with them as well, to create this context of preserving their own past for the future. But now what I want to do is bring you back to the science. I think that's, you know, that's certainly my, that's my love. I'm, I'm going to say this. I hope that I don't uh, offend anyone with this comment. I wish I had been the one who actually said this, but I'm not. Um, a very famous archaeologist at a plenary session of our American Anthropological Association was giving this wonderful speech, and he was uh, pronouncing the wonders of archaeology. He said, you know, archaeology is the most fun you can have with your pants on. And, <laughs> and I... I really believe that I have so much fun doing this archaeology, even if I am being dangled on the end of a rope someplace, you know, hanging for my dear life while I'm, you know, being coached by Pete. But in any case, I'm going to take you to Samsung, and I'm going to give you some background to Samsung in a moment. But one thing to be clear on is, is that what you're looking at now are not caves. They look like caves, they might smell like caves in some sense, but really what they are, and you'll see this in a moment, are shaft tombs. And if you saw that video that Pete produced for us in, the, in his discussion, those were the apartment complexes of later migrants to this region. They came in sometime around, oh, let's say 12 to 1300 AD and populated very large numbers of these cave complexes. What you're looking right now, though, is a burial chamber, a set of burial chambers that dates to the dates you see up there that were created in a very special process. And let me give you the animation that you can see on the iPad version of the National Geographic article on this project. 
Tomb 5 is located among the Samzong Caves in the Mustang region of Nepal. Exposed when the cliff face collapsed, these mortuary caves were once reached by narrow access tubes. In this artist's reconstruction, we can explore the contents of Tomb 5. The man buried here was likely a local leader and is surrounded by clues to his high status. There are sacrificed animals, wood and bamboo cups, and a copper vessel that may have held a barley beer. There is ground flour on the floor. One mystery is the presence of a child's skeleton, perhaps 10 years old, of whom little is known. The burial coffin is carefully painted with a man, horses, and trees. Inside, there are iron daggers, and the skeleton shows cut marks on the bone, possible evidence of the ritual removal of flesh. Adorning the remains is a small bronze mirror, and over the face, a painted mask made of gold and silver. This chamber answers some questions, but poses many more. It also suggests that other caves may be hidden nearby, awaiting discovery. Uh, the key to this, though, is thinking that these are tombs, not caves. They were dug into the shafts, as I pointed out. And what's important about them is we never would have seen them had we simply walked by them. That is, if that earthquake had not uh, calved off those, those uh, cliff faces, we simply wouldn't have known they were there. One of the things that we do know about, though, is that this part of the, the Himalaya in general, and uh, much of the Tibetan plateau, for that matter, is an extraordinary cultural, linguistic, and genetic mosaic. That is, we know that there are many different kinds of cultures here that, that thrived in this region, but we really know very little about them in great detail. That is, we can take ethnographies and take a look at different, different groups that reside in different parts of the Himalaya, but one thing that's very clear is that the, the population history of this region is far more complex than just getting a snapshot of different cultures as they live right now in this region. And so one of the things that motivated this project, one of the major themes that I'm about to address right now, is going to be the migration theme. That is, I'm really concerned about thinking about when did people get here first? What were those people like? Where were they from? What parts of the Himalayas, what parts of India, what parts of the Tibetan Plateau could they have possibly originated from? So much of our research then, looking at Samsung, and then looking at sites that are somewhat earlier than that as well, that are actually two more cultural entities that we know about that are before this, what can they say about this remarkable cultural mosaic that we have in this region today? What you're looking at on the left is a Tibetan, on the other side is a Sherpa, but if you go down into the foothills, you'll see a variety of different mixed groups of people that have very different characteristics. Their phenotypes and their cultures, for that matter, as well as their languages, are something extraordinarily different. We want to understand that process. One other theme, though, I'd like to address before I conclude tonight, then, is that I want to talk about objects, things, that connect our region of Mustang to the rest of the world. And as you got a sense from Pete, that is, there's a sense that, yes, Mustang is there, but also Mustang looks isolated in some ways as well. But yet, we think it's quite connected. Watch this video, please. The expedition takes place in Nepal, in an ancient kingdom called Mustang. Here, the Kaligandaki River carved a migration route through the Himalaya, connecting China and Tibet with India. Mark believes Mustang was once a crossroads and suspects this river corridor was an important artery linked to the famous east-west trade route further north, the Silk Road. We know that we have clear connections to Tibetan Buddhism, to artistic motifs and designs and iconography that connect this part of Mustang to the western Himalaya, to further north, as well, on the other side of the Taklamakan Desert. And you're looking at Luigi Fini. He's not part of our project, but he's been working in Mustang for a number of years, doing extraordinary reconstructions and restorations of Tibetan Buddhist art in important monasteries and temples in the region. So it's clear that there is a connection here. That is, we know there's some kind of connection, but the character of that connection is really somewhat unclear. 
History only takes us so far. They say, well, of course there was trade up and down this valley. But what do we know about the antiquity of this trade? How well does it connect to anything that we would want to talk about in terms of the Silk Road? So it's, it's easy to talk about the idea, but the, until recently, the empirical evidence for connecting this part of Nepal, or any part of Nepal for that matter, to anything about the Silk Road simply did not exist. So I bring you back to tomb five again. I suggested I'd be back and here we are. Tomb five is that elite barrel that we located at Samsung. I'm going to show you some of the artifacts that come out of tomb five because they're absolutely critical and key indicators of this connection about the Silk Road that are absolutely fascinating. This gold and silver mask, I didn't know what it was when we dug it out. That is, you know, Pete brings it down and says, look at this, that's, well, that's cool. Uh, I didn't know what it was, it's very light, it's very thin, it's only a millimeter thick. Um, it's tiny, it's only about this big. And I thought it was tin, it was so light and so fragile. It turns out it's two pieces of metal, one piece of gold and one piece of silver hammered together. Our metallurgist, Giovanni Massa at the uh, UCL, um, University College London, uh, is doing the metallurgy on this and other metals from the project. This piece of, this is, this is extraordinary. This has never been discovered in Nepal before. It is a unique object that has, though, a resonance with other parts of the Himalayan world. In particular, that is a mask no more than about 200 kilometers to the west from the northwestern region of northwestern India called Malari, the site called Malari. That's a pure gold mask, and I learned about that two years ago. Compare this, then, to another gold mask found in the region as well. This is from the Guga region, which is in western Tibet, very close to where I used to do my work, discovered by accident, unfortunately not by me, but by colleagues. But you get a sense of, again, very similar sorts of treatment. If you continue up to the north, you get yourself up to Xinjiang, you find the same kind of burial practice taking place. Masks, usually of gold or silver, placed over the faces of the dead. If you go further to the west into Kazakhstan, even further beyond that, you'll find a very similar mortuary pattern. So that very simple mask that you see in Samsung is reflecting this broad cultural tradition that we see stretching from west coming to the east. Now, I've not seen this in Tibet other than in western Tibet right now. It will be fascinating to see how far that extends into the eastern parts or other parts of Nepal for that matter as well. Humble things like beads. These are glass beads. When we found them, I wasn't really sure what they were, I'll be honest with you. Much of my work until relatively recently has been in the Andes. They don't make glass beads in the Andes. So I find these things and go, what is this stuff? And finally it dawns on me, ah, oh, they're glass. Well, you can take that glass now and you can have it, you can look at the chemical composition of that glass. And what you find is extraordinary. This set of beads, and that was with tomb five, by the way, this is something that was probably draped over the head of the individual. Beads from Pakistan, someplace down in the Indus Valley. These beads are the ones that really give us the big clue. Sasania, it uh, was a polity in Persia, which is of course now in modern Iran. Absolutely smoking gun evidence of a connection of some kind of this little place in Nepal to the Silk Road themselves. Uh, these are even more fascinating in some ways. They're not directly Silk Road. They're from either South Asia, that is someplace in very far southern India, or Southeast Asia brought over to the continent by maritime trade and traded all the way up into the Himalayas for God knows what reason and put on the dead of this individual in this tomb. This is one of our more extraordinary finds. It's actually tiny. It's only about five centimeters or so in size. Not much to look at. It's Chinese silk. Now, Chinese silk, of course, travels all back and forth. At some point, people start making silk outside China after they've figured out how to steal the worms and do all that sort of thing and put that to work. What you're looking at is a wonderful piece of Chinese silk found in Tomb 5 as well. Dyes are being analyzed right now. The uh, person doing this also at University College London was just flabbergasted. She said, I usually see all the pretty stuff. I don't get to see the the kind of crummy stuff. <laughs> so she was thrilled to see something that was more quotidian. But again, look at the connection. Masks, beads, silks that connect us very clearly to the Silk Road in some manner. Finally, the last object that I'd like to talk about is this, this bronze disc. Um, it's in very fragile state. It's disintegrating rapidly. Um, but what's a very clear indicator of where this is from, it's not from the west. It's not Silk Road West. It's Silk Road East. This is from Lhasa or beyond. It's a medallion that's often placed on the dead of important uh, religious figures in modern Tibetan 
the modern Tibetan world, like those lamas that might have been in those kabams. What you're looking at is this object then that was placed on the dead individual in tomb five, and it's a good indicator of the, of the status of this. And so what you're looking at then is another clear indicator of Mustang being connected to this much broader world. So I'd like to conclude my presentation by, by a few comments. Um, I've given you some science, and I, of course, get excited about that science and find it absolutely fascinating. Corey is the, you know, we, he takes the dry material that I've talked about this evening, and he puts it into a visual framework that provides you with a way to, that kind of gets you. And so with that introduction, I'd like to bring Corey up to the stage. Thank you very much for your attention tonight. It's really been a great pleasure.